Transcription number 457, Beat Up Recorder. Transcriber's Notes. Hey, so I don't know whose account this is, but if you want me to post what I found, I don't give a crap. Some guy in a suit paid me to analyze these sound waves on some beat up recorder. Turns out the waveforms are roughly correlated to binary and therefore into language. A week later, I translated the whole thing. Really weird. Grammar's mine. The guy in the suit never showed up with my money. So yeah, I'll just post it here. Maybe others can get something from it. Transcription begins. We heard him from the moment he stepped out of his door and into his truck. From the confines of his rundown home, he thought modernity could cast us out. But outside, his tools were fewer. The man's son feared the dark. No matter the time of day, the man's house was lit up like a firework display, each room beaming out at us with a fiery grin. Other houses would succumb and find us eventually, but not the man's house. The man worked nights and left his son swamped in the rays. The greatest pleasure is in the conquering of the greatest prey. We had followed the man as he drove around the city for years now. He would set out after midnight and search for a cell tower in need of repair. Throughout the night, he would climb the tower with a headlamp atop his head, make the necessary repairs under the soft glow of safety lights, and then descend to the terrible gaze of his truck's headlights. There was a tremendous sense of guilt in the man for leaving his son at home by himself. He brought a tape recorder with him, and chatted into it to make objects of comfort for his son. Usually, it was inane. Truly, it was a diary of sorts, one that his son could play at night if he ever missed his father. Perhaps, we wondered, the man salves his guilt by keeping the lights on and by recording the tapes. It is more for his benefit than his son's. After all, the man only leaves the lights on in his son's room and lets the rest of his home succumb. But night after night, we watched a house without a single darkened room. There is no reason he should talk into the taves, yet that never stops him. As the nights grew darker, our desperation to snatch a greater prey grew greater than our instinct to hide. We were never sure whether it was the son of the father that we desired most. Perhaps it was neither but what their bond represented. They had wound their clocks back in the dusk, stole hours of the day from them. Soon, the lights in the house flickered on in the late afternoon instead of the evening. The boy came back from school and refused to leave the house, even when the burning brightness of the streetlights smothered the tarmac road in sickly amber. The boy was wise enough to know that the lights were merely a bandage on a terminal wound. As the solstice approached, the man was taking more jobs. We heard him explain to his son that the best time to do his work was when everyone else was asleep. The son was never persuaded, and the father was never persuaded to stay. On a cold night, the man stepped out of his glowing home and into his truck with his tools. He must have found another job to do. We followed as he extricated himself from the city, down the Ardeal highways, and into a smaller set of capillary roads until he arrived at a small town upon a verdant hill, a single cell tower towering over the low homes. Our hands reached out to him, eager to conquer what we knew we could, but our mind told us to hold. It was much quieter than the city which meant our meals might be best prepared, but it was always better to be prudent when hungry. The man parked his truck beside the singular cell tower, attached his tools to his belt, hooked himself up to the tower with a series of harnesses and robes, slung the tape recorder around his neck, hit the record button and began climbing. 
He talked of the tower being a routine checkup, an easy and quick job if anything. He talked to his son through the recorder like he was there with him. His delivery was convincing. Often we would check the glowing home and confirm that his son was still in bed, bathed in light, and not climbing alongside the man. The man apologized for snapping at his son for getting a question wrong on the math homework. Then the man talked about when they might go see mom again. The man climbed up the tower carefully, making new anchor points on the steel so that if he were to fall, he should be safe. By the time that he was halfway up the light, it looked rather weak from the base where we watched. Invariably, his conversation would turn to the issue of his son's fear of the dark. He would attempt to persuade his son that there was nothing to fear in every way he could. Often, he would come back to showing how what he was doing proved there was nothing to fear in the dark. That even in the dark, he could help people. When he looked down from the top of the tower, the sea of dark beneath could be scary. But he knew that every time he descended to the bottom again... It would have just be the ground that he had remembered from before. It was the arrogance that our hands hated the most. Our mind whispered comforts to our belly and our feet dragged us closer. He reached the top of the tower, pried open the control box, and began tinkering with the electrics. Nearby, the hum of the pulses that rippled through us from every home and phone died for a brief few seconds. This was a man who had the power to silence the world, but reactivate it moments later. The anger took hold of the hands. Our minds shouted no, but our hands reached out faster than we could think them back. We commanded our legs to dig into the earth, but they too rebelled, gliding to the base of the tower and eviscerating the anchor ropes the man would use to get back down. Let him fear the dark. And then our mind was swayed too. Such pleasure in watching the man talk to his son through his recorder, never knowing what was to come. There was a sweet pleasure in knowing how his promises of taking his son out for a pizza the next day would come to naught. His words dripped out of his mouth and into our belly. He finished his work and the ripples reappeared from the scattered homes nearby. It was only by that time that our eyes turned to re-examine the town that we saw the absence of people. Beds were empty, cars left running, a baby monitor set to watch an absent crib. A fire needed tempering in the hearth, and soon a home that had stood for centuries would burn bright. This of course had happened before when our limbs had whispered temptation to our mind, before our eyes or mouth could see our mouth had already consumed, and our belly rumbled for more. The man tested the tautness of his rope and felt it pull freely. His face barely moved, but he started hauling his anchor rope up with widening eyes. Strange how surprised he seemed when the bottom was ripped apart like it was put through a shredder. We were the prey's companion all their lives. Yet still, they're confused when we make ourselves known. Now the years had turned in his own head. His legs wobbled so he sat down, seeking to reassert control of himself. These old towers weren't designed with practicality in mind, but they could still be climbed down without a set of ropes. It just wouldn't be safe. He had stopped the recording and then resumed it. He spoke of inane things, as if something hadn't went wrong. Even when temporally displaced, the man felt he still had to soothe his son. Even when he examined the end of the rope, he talked about visiting mom at the weekend. Even when he looked into the surrounding town and spotted the car in the middle of an intersection abandoned, and windows splattered with blood, he talked about what they would have for dinner the next night. He stopped the recording again and looked out, eyes betraying little. Finally, he clenched his fists and peered down from his stoop. We looked back up at him, but he saw nothing. 
Outside of the beams of the truck's headlights, the world seemed darker than it had ever been. He searched for any life in the dark, but he couldn't find it. He reached into his bag and pulled out an energy bar, holding it between his finger and thumb, peering down in the dark, trying to decide how much of the unreal he wished to believe. Finally, fear went out and he dropped the energy bar into the dark. He never heard it impact the ground. He bit his lip and felt shivers on the back of his neck, drowning in the pulsating crimson glow of the tower's light. He tried to point his flashlight down at us, but it was too far away to have any effect. He moved for his phone and made a call to the police. He wanted to explain what was actually happening, but opted instead to say he got stuck and saw someone trying to steal his car. They said that they would send someone out there shortly, but in the meantime, the man sat down and stared into the darkness, gently holding the recorder in his hand like it would somehow save him. The police did arrive. He saw them on the horizon driving into town with flashing blue lights. To get into town, they needed to use a road that passed through a dark wood that blocked the man's eyeline but he could still see the blue lights flashing against the firs. The blue lights fought us off for a time, but we flooded the car faster than they could expel us. Our hands had seceded from our mind and ripped the flesh from the bone, the steel from rubber. The man watched the blue lights die halfway through the road. He deflated, but he kept his cool. He looked back down at us with a new understanding of his situation. He was food. He glanced at the crisscrossing steel beams that marked the path to the ground, to his truck and to us. He bit his lip, considered the path and then took a slow breath before sitting beside the control panel. Many wouldn't have approached the situation with the same calm, but the man took the eventuality in his stride. He took out his recorder and talked to his son about the phobia of the dark. The man had spent the past 10 years fighting the dark with his son. In a way, he was better prepared than most to face it down. He told his son that there was no shame in keeping the lights on, as long as you could face your fear from a place of safety. One day, confronting fear will happen. It was inevitable. But there was no reason that day had to be today. The man said that he would face the dark for his son. And to his credit, he did. For hours, he sat at the top of the tower while we prattled on the bottom, trying to beckon him down with dreams of oblivion. He stared at us, waiting for the morning sun to rise. The towns and police had satiated our hands and belly for a time. But we soon grew hungry again. There was more meat in them, but our hands knew that defeating the man would satiate us for years. There's a greater pleasure in killing someone defiant than someone ignorant. Our mind found a newfound respect for the prey. We permitted him a swift end. Before we knew it, our teeth were wrapped around the steel beams at the bottom of the tower. We gnawed through the steel each bite reverberating up to the man above. After a few minutes, we had bitten through one of the support beams. The tower groaned as its weight lurched to the side, and we looked up at the man who clutched onto his recorder, still staring, still thinking. His defiance only motivated us further. Soon our minds succumbed to the hunger too and the hands were directed to the most essential support beams. Within minutes, the tower screeched and groaned as it verged on collapse. Wires snapped and sparked as they grew taut and blasted apart. The man held on to a steel beam for grim death. Our claws and hands eviscerated the final support beam, and the tower screamed a death cry as it leaned towards the town. The man was ready. In a final moment of will, the man gripped the recorder and threw it as hard as he could towards his truck. 
As the truck fell, the recorder arced across the starry sky, landing in the harsh headlight beams of the truck. The tower crashed into a house, and we tore the man limb from limb, drunk on the blood, and as the morning sun rose, we... Transcriber's notes. And it ends there. After a bit of googling, I found a news story from the early 2000s that lines up with this story. I'll probably keep the lights on tonight.